something that is achievable, that it can be uh, like a coordination between the civil society, the private sector, and the public sector. <coughs> and it's a way, the way to go. Like, let me give you the word for the final comments of Vice President Javier. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. And, and you know, I've never done this in this room. I think the way I learned Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Yo me quedo con, con tres mensajes muy importantes de esta conversación. El primero es que lo que se mide se hace. Eh, y es fundamental si queremos tener éxito en el desarrollo, el establecer metas, el establecer planes, medir cómo estamos evolucionando eh, y, y, y seguir en el camino. Segundo, es que la relación entre el sector privado y los SDGs, los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sustentable, es una relación de dos tipos. Primero que nada, no se puede pensar en crecimiento, reducción de la pobreza, reducción de la desigualdad, sin el sector privado. Esto es fundamental porque de aquí vendrán las fuentes de empleo que ayudarán a que la gente esté mejor. Eh, es fundamental para establecer los programas de educación que hagan sentido para, para donde va a estar de empleo en el futuro, es necesario para la agenda de productividad, de infraestructura, que a propósito Colombia es un gran ejemplo en movilización de recursos del sector privado eh, a infraestructura. Pero tampoco se puede pensar en la creación de valor de largo plazo sin tener en cuenta la sustentabilidad. Y el tercer mensaje con el que me quedo es que el éxito depende de una buena coordinación entre diferentes órdenes de gobierno. Los servicios públicos se prestan a nivel local. Y en este sentido, dado que el papel de las comunidades, de los jóvenes, es esencial para tener éxito, se requiere de pactos sociales sólidos. Y estos pactos sociales sólidos dependen hoy más que nunca de transparencia, rendición de cuentas y buena gobernanza. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, vicepresidente familiar. Y muchas gracias a toda la audiencia. Well, thank you so much. This uh, was a fantastic uh, panel, and I want to bet because this is the first time I listened to my uh, good uh, colleague and friend, Jorge Rodriguez, uh, speaking Spanish. So, uh, with uh, Islam and, uh, and, uh, uh, and other colleagues, we're uh, 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 talking about uh, 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 whether we are going to be uh, using Spanish in the and the same language. I want to know from you what would be your next step with Colombia, and what should be the next step uh, for um, the minister about engagement on OECD. So I want to ask you for how half a minute from you that, and then your next steps both to you as well, and my good professor, who is an assignment for you of the ideas for action. So we have uh, 90 seconds to hear from you all about your next steps. In well, Spanish or English, what should we do next? Well, uh, uh, on the next steps with Colombia, the uh, Minister and I will be discussing the program uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, so uh, we will have a very uh, ambitious agenda with, with Colombia. We support Colombia in many, in many ways. Um, I think that the center of the overall strategy that we have clearly is and has to be the peace process. So, in three steps. Let me begin with one that is global. You saw in the pictures from Medellin the cable, the metro cable. That's fundamental for the transformation that the Comuna 13 has. Esteban was just talking about that. Next step, we're going to build the cable not to the northeast, but to the northwest of the city to deliver the same type of results. Uh, President Clinton was in Colombia in June, and when I met him, he told me, I just come back from the Comuna 13. He was there visiting as a tourist. Probably he had ice cream. Where is Sebastian? <laughs> you were the guy. So come to Medellin, go to Comuna 13, and you will see for yourself the transformation. That's goal number one for a city development initiative. OECD accession. Yes. Uh, the many of you that are citizens of countries that are already members of the OECD, give us a hand. 
help us with that accession process. We're just two committees away. The OECD accession process requires 23 committees. Brewing the accession, we passed 21. There are two remaining committees, and those committees will be the November, the Labor Committee and the Trade Committee. So support from all the member countries of the OECD will be a nice member of the OECD. We will raise the average growth of the OECD. So, um, and you will give hope to the others as well. The yes, and uh, with the World Bank, um, if I were to choose one priority from the World Bank, yeah, the other with you, the director with all the money. Look, uh, we don't have that much fiscal space. This is very technical. This is this is uh, because we have uh, fiscal responsibility, but we need more support to the private sector. They can do a lot. The private sector. So support for the private sector is decisive in this transformation of Colombia. We need to bring in more business, the business to have more investment, especially Stefan said something about the entrepreneurship of the young and uh, the entrepreneurial spirit of the young. So we need to support them with microfinance to make sure that all these things actually happen yeah. and that there is adequate finance. And I think that's a, that would be a really important issue which we have to work in the next say, 13 years if we want to be a developed country. Let's not forget that. Excellent. And this goes away with our development paper on uh, developing finance and next steps and engaging the private sector and uh, the cascade of it. So, I'm the <coughs> professor, private sector, community leader. Okay. A few seconds each. Okay, well, there are a few things. Like, we are working actually in the university, I think, in many universities in the world without actually one initiative that is led by Dr. Mohadi, that is idea of corruption. So the process of ideas for action is like including the students and the very young students to align not only is like the ideas for action, ideas for action you can um, ideas for action. The and, and it's a part of like encouraging entrepreneurship and encouraging it's finding uh like the uh, the north of the development or appropriation of the creation of new enterprises with the north of the SDGs. So that one is what we one idea is like looking the case specifically specifically in Colombia, it's coming the piece that is as a strategy as it was presented in the Minister Project. So ideas for action, and let me give the word finally for Colin. I want to make two colleagues over Patricia and Anthony. Uh well perhaps it's quite easy to continue with in this uh, private public partnership. And um, there is a pilot council for a sustainable peace. There is a group of companies, um, companies, universities, and think tanks in Colombia that get together in order to follow up the peace agreement. We are working in that, in, in that way because we, as a country, we had a very successful peace process. But now we have a peace agreement that we don't have a peaceful uh, country. So there is a lot that needs to be done in uh, so we need to find a way to move forward and the private sector is very willing to, to continue with this with this compromise, with this commitment with the with the public sector in that uh, following the, the piece of the uh, implementation. Okay. Uh, the the what we are talking about is very important uh, saber cuál es nuestra vocación y qué es lo que sabemos hacer todos eh, sobre la mesa y sentarnos en un triángulo empresa privada, gobierno y comunidad y desde ahí de acuerdo a nuestras vocaciones y a lo que sabemos hacer empezar a trabajar en un por el mismo camino todos juntos muchas gracias Fantastic panel, very grateful to you. Now we'll be preparing the uh, stage for the uh, next uh, panelist. And uh, our first speaker will be our managing uh, director, uh, Mr. Yen. So, yeah, he's going to be speaking first. And then we have four country cases. And we have the private sector, and of course, the UNDP and the uh, the presidency of the Jazz and the presented uh, to the uh, uh, the
capacity of development uh, actors at the local level to finance and to develop to deliver services that change the lives of people in their community. The World Bank Group is working with our many partners, including countries, the United Nations, the private sector, and civil society to provide more effective, coordinated, and accelerated support to countries for implementing the ICT at national and local levels. We are doing this because the SDGs cover tell very well with the World Bank Group's own twin goals to end extreme poverty by 2030, the same as SDG number one, and to boost shared prosperity, similar to SDG 10. Both pursue in a sustainable and inclusive manner. In addition, our organizational structure is composed to, to compose of global practices and cross-cutting solution areas, which match the 17 SDGs almost one to one. Our core loop strategy documents connects our own 2030 vision to the SDG agenda of things like global public goods, strengthening domestic resources, mobilization, and supporting growth in, in, in situations of fragility, conflict, and, and violence, among other things. The World Bank Group's corporate scorecard, our benchmarks for program, is also aligned with the 2030 agenda providing the right incentives for our staff to make development happen at the global level. Our strategies at the country level are designed in partnership with our country clients, and we generally see strong alignment with the global SDG agenda of things like governance, natural resource management, gender equality, climate action, and many other areas. In short, the World Bank Group is fully aligned to work with our clients at the national, regional, and the local levels to help them achieve their own version of achieving that vision. We look forward to hearing the views of our distinguished guests about the state of progress of the SDGs and how the World Bank Group can strengthen our partnership with you to achieve your vision to protect people and our planet while leaving no one behind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Um, well, uh, thank you, Mr. Yang. Um, um, very good introduction to this uh, uh, panel. This, uh, the intention is for this panel to be very much interactive and it will run in the same order of uh, seating. Um, so um, we'll start uh, with Ede, um, who's almost prepared for uh, uh, tough questions. And um, this may come to you as a surprise. <laughs> um, so I've been attending all of these sessions during the last uh, two days. And um, the talk about globalization uh, was not very uh, favorable about the trends of globalization and multilateralism. And when we are presenting localization of sustainable development goals, it is not really a way to escape from globalization. It's not an inward looking. This is my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and this is not really an isolationist approach in development. As you have seen it, SDGs at the grassroots, taking the global goals, translating them into national priorities, taking actions at the Medellin level. So what, what the World Bank is seeing matters in this area. How are we translating these global goals, our twin goals, um, 
into the rural, urban, uh, and localities um, at large. In addition, of course, what you were planning initially to say. And then I'll, I'll, I'll go back into the three honorable uh, ministers, but all of them have a very interesting story, and all of them submitted their uh, intentions and their uh, aspirational goals uh, to the um, UN system in, in July, either this year or last year. So I have some good summaries of your plans, so are informed about uh, what you are going to be uh, saying, and I have a few questions for you. Then from the private sector, and then we'll have the last day and the concluding remarks from um, um, a great partner um, by person and organization, the new uh, head of the United uh, Nations Development uh, Program was with us here the first time in this uh, new capacity, so we need to learn from them um, what are the plans and problems. So, Eddie. Thank you so much. And look, uh, when, when we travel around the world and we talk to mayors and governors, we see many of them the same messages that you hear from the mayor of Medellin. In many cases, they begin to see that the local agenda has a strong connection with global agendas. And therefore, the uh, SDGs, they do not see many cases as an imposition from the UN, but really a platform to be able to monitor and progress their own development plans in that direction. So, for example, on climate change, when you have the global accord of majors with 8,000 majors with, uh, that have more than 10% of the population that are saying, we are committed, and actually we don't see nations moving fast enough. And climate change is urgent for us, not only because of the health and the livability of the city, but because we have an important role at the global level. It is very inspiring and very encouraging. And therefore, what we see here in the World Bank is how do we support these processes and what are the challenges that these mayors and governments are facing. And uh, in the case of Medellin, you see some of the solutions, but actually I mean, say a lot of the things that we're seeing. First, tremendous challenges on financing, because there's no clarity on, there's not this scaling down that you have from Colombia of the national development plans and the financing plan. There's no clarity on the transfer from the national to the local government, the, and there's no uh, understanding of where that money is going to go. And also, there's no clarity on the tools that the mayors and governments can use to raise funds at the local level to implement the DGs. Second, there's a lot of, in many countries, a lot of, uh, Institutional overlaps of the mixes of health and transfer of water are going and implementing projects, and the mayors and governors don't understand what is going on and don't necessarily meet the local needs that they understand so well into this process. And then finally, knowledge, because we find that mayors and governors are the best copiers. They look at solutions and they try to implement into this process. The message that we get from mayors and governors is urgency. It's urgency because they, they, their communities, the people who voted for them, are knocking at their doors and saying, we need help for all, we need one acceptation for all, we need that, and turns out that that's the SDGs. And therefore, they leave the SDGs with the urgency that sometimes national governments don't have. And therefore, if there's one method that I want to leave to all of you, is to say that if you think that we're going to achieve 17 goals, 169 targets in 30 years, waiting for the national governments to happen, it's not going to happen. Everybody needs to be running in the same direction and therefore the support from all sides to make sure that the national governments, mayors and governments, can implement in coordinated ways plans to leave no one behind is a critical part of the solution. Thank you so much. Um, now I'd like to turn to um, the uh, Honourable Minister uh, from uh, Denmark, uh, uh, Minister uh, Tony. And um, my, my question really, um, in the world of MDGs, there was no role of Denmark or the Nordic countries but to support those countries which need help and assistance. Now with the universality of the sustainable development goals, you are expected to do more than what you are doing. When we're discussing the 2030 agenda, some people mentioned in your country that you already could be in 2029 or it could be 2031. Uh, but when uh, we read your um, the, the presentation that you made to the, uh, to the UN, we saw that you highlighted um, areas that we need to maintain, that we did very well in, especially areas of governance, transparency, um, improving the information ranking, and uh, maintaining your position among the least corrupt uh, nations in the world. Um, so one of the targets is to keep 
the good things as good as they are, improving them. But you have other things like uh, research and development um, uh, as a challenge that you need to do more on. There is the challenge of gender equality and the other one related to uh, sustainable consumption and sustainable food. So even a country that has been ranked by different indices as in the top, it has um, a good list of items um, to deal with. But listen, I see this really as the beauty of the SDGs. Uh, the SDG I see as a fantastic vision for uh, the global world that we all should work hard to achieve. And coming from a privileged country like uh, Denmark, uh, I think it's, 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 it's good that we also have things that we should improve on. Uh, but having said all this, uh, excuse me, but um, I would like to refer to what we just learned about Colombia. Yeah, really. Because I also think that this was, it, it was really fantastic to, to, to learn more about a specific country. And I was impressed and I was proud. I was impressed by the way Colombia has taken the SDGs and, and the political leadership that we just heard and, and how they move forward to, 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 to uh, become a developed country as it was mentioned. I think this was very impressive, and then I'm proud, I'm really proud on behalf of the, the global leaders who sat down in 2015 and agreed on the Sustainable Development Goals, knowing that we in Denmark also have a few things to, 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 to uh, fix, but, but, uh, but still the overall uh, achievement that we should all head for is absolutely impressive. And you were mentioning gender equality, which is also an issue in my country, uh, but gender equality is, as Minister for Development Cooperation, a very high priority for me in the development portfolio because I strongly believe that we will not achieve the sustainable development goals at a global level if we are not addressing the SDG number five, gender equality. Um, and uh, gender equality is very important uh, from a human rights perspective. Uh, millions of women around the world is not uh, having the same rights as men in their respective societies and this means that they cannot use their full potential uh, in contributing to development in their different societies and this we have to this we have to fix <laughs> we have to change this uh, it makes good sense to 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 give women uh, the same opportunities, the same rights as men in their respective societies. You know from different analysis that we can increase the global uh, GDP with up to 25% if women are getting the same rights and this means also the same possibilities as men. So uh, there are a lot that we can do at a global level. We also know from, from, from uh, surveys that uh, that for each year a girl is attending school, she will increase her future income by 10%. And this is why education is also high in our high priority in our development portfolio, uh, especially when it comes to girls in the human in, in, in human crisis situation. I mean, we need to make sure that the girls in affected by by, by the humanitarian crisis are getting access to school and also the possibility of financing for school. Just to mention a few of the, of, of the priorities in our development portfolio. And then back to Denmark. Uh, you're right, gender equality. Uh, if, when we look into academia, we have a huge challenge because we can see that uh, female um, uh, academia is less uh, um, or tends less to, to become uh, professors um, uh, and, and we need to, to really work on how we make, uh, how we change this. Right, on uh, municipalities, uh, uh, Minister, uh, in your report you mentioned that the uh, local authorities spend on 70% of Denmark's uh, public uh, budget. What are you doing better and different in this uh, way in terms of engaging the local authorities in the decision uh, making? Um, are there any uh, advances in what you already have in this uh, kind of coordination mechanism? Denmark, Denmark is a very decentralized country uh, in terms of our welfare uh, services. 
are nearly all run by uh, the local uh, authorities, and um, this is this this is the way it has been for many years in in, in Denmark, and um, and um, we. I mean, this is the way we are, we are distributing our wealth and the way that we are making sure that uh, that at the local level, um, this is really what matters. Um, uh, so the SGDs at the local level in, uh, in, in, in Denmark is, um, I would guess that we have a very high score on, on, on that one. Right, thank you so much, Honorable uh, Minister, uh, Mr. Van Dam, you and me. Uh, Met before in several um, occasions, including when you um, um, led the process of um, competition of Indonesia to uh, to host the um, uh, IMF World Bank meeting, which is going to be taking place like this time uh, next uh, next year. So congratulations uh, for that. Meanwhile, you have a big responsibility um, in your uh, capacity as minister responsible for following up on the Sustainable Development Goals, the Agenda 2030, and um, I uh, attended your presentation um, in, in New York. And um, I, I would say that the 63 presentations have many common elements because of the template of the UN, but definitely there are some interesting aspects that one really can re emphasize. One is related to the uh, participatory approach and the inclusiveness um, on your process. Second was the partnership and the South-South cooperation. But more related to our work here on the localization is the issue related to budget reforms at the local uh, level. So I, I would be quite uh, happy and pleased of all the audience to learn more from uh, your experience and what we'd be expecting um, uh, from the bank. I did ask this question to the Honorable Minister from Denmark because she is not in the receiving end of the bank. But uh, of course, uh, Indonesia is one of the strong partners in uh, financial and technical cooperation. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Mohidin. Uh, first of all, uh, let me uh, update you a little bit about uh, SDG implementation in Indonesia. Uh, of course, we have been blessed by the coincidence in which the SDGs started in 2015, while this current government also started in 2015. So the first thing that we did at the time is to mainstream the SDG into five years development plan, which is the, the period of this current government. And then from uh, 70 goals and then 169 targets, at least we have included 94 out of the 169 targets. Of course, we are still working on metadata, especially to complete all the definition of the indicators and to make sure all indicators will be uh, measurable. And then, uh, why SDG is important? At least when we did the MVP, we were having, you know, I think maybe good performance by achieving 48 out of 67 uh, targets, but of course, uh, this is not just about the percentage of uh, achievement, but more importantly, we are still missing the 90 targets, and some of them are quite critical because it's related, for example, to uh, maternal mortality rate and still related to the HIV prevalence. So it means that we still have a lot of homework to do through the SDG. And then the SDG itself for Indonesia will be very much critical in terms of uh, development perspective. Because, as you know, SDG will end in 2030. And 2030 is also very important for Indonesia on the other aspect, because probably in 2030, our demographic bonus will be ended. Currently, Indonesia is experiencing demographic bonus. And as we learn from our peers in East Asia, especially Japan, Korea, and lately China, when they almost, you know, uh, at the end of the period of the demographic bonus, they already move, becoming uh, advanced or developed economy. So again, we see the, the strategic point of SDP to help Indonesia 
lifting our status currently at the lower middle income to the upper middle, hopefully to the high income, and after 2030, hopefully we will be at the uh, developed economy. So we would like to mainstream the SDG, not only just for the sake of the you know achieving. bring the country into a better uh, position like in terms of prosperity. And uh, answering your uh, question regarding the localizing SDG and what World Bank can do. Of course, uh, Indonesia is a decentralized country uh, since 2001, uh, yeah, 2001. And then uh, most of the government uh, authorities have been uh, delegated to the local government. So it means whenever they have the new local government coming, either at provincial level, uh, district, as well as municipality, they need to make their five-year plan, like uh, in our case at the national level. So as in my euro, as a minister of national development planning, we always give some kind of assistance, technical assistance to the local government that just did their local election to formulate their five years plan. Of course, according to our national planning law, any five years plan at the local level has to refer to the national level. And as I just mentioned, in our five years plan, we already mainstream the SDG. So it means whenever they refer to the national plan, indirectly, they should already mainstream the SDG into local development plan. However, we still need to uh, enforce, you know, the, the importance of SDG into their plan. So uh, now we are working on so-called national action plan, and then after national action plan, six months later, we will uh, go for the regional or local action plan. So we hope by having this local action plan everything that will be done by the local government will be in line in terms of achieving the national goal. And in fact, for, from, my, uh, from the national perspective, localizing SDG is very much important. How can we achieve you know, those uh, 169 targets at the national level if, they, if we are not fully supported by the local level? So we need to make sure every local government in Indonesia Currently, we have so many local governments, I think more than 500 local governments. So we need to make sure each one of them has to work together at the same pace, at the same uh, pace, in order to make sure by 2030, we can achieve as many as possible, of course, with the targets. And of course, when it comes to the role of the World Bank, uh, World Bank, I think, has been uh, quite helpful in helping our decentralization process. So in this case, whenever we formulate the regional action plan, I think the so-called either capacity building or the support in terms of technical system from the World Bank, I think will be very much useful because you know it's not easy to handle all this, uh, I think we have 550 uh, local government, provincial level, district level, municipality, so, Every local government has different capacity in terms of human resources. So it means we need to make sure the capacity building at the human resources there at the local level. At the second step, after they have appropriate human resources, then of course we need to make sure they can have a good local action plan and they can do the implementation of the plan itself. So I think the World Bank role I think will be very much critical in making sure all the planning formulation and implementation could be done successfully until uh, 2030. Right, thank you so much. Um, now, Minister Fahoui, uh, you uh, are very much familiar with the uh, multilateral system of the international organization which makes it uh, a kind of a challenge uh, for some of us in the negotiating matters with you. So it's not a negotiation uh, session now. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy that in your list of priorities, most of it, as you presented it in the UN, most of it have been already covered by the previous two speakers, 
including, of course, Colombia. The issue of mainstreaming, as I mentioned by the Honorable Minister from Indonesia, issues related to gender, the subnational plans and coordination. But there is one issue that we emphasize, as actually put it as number one, which is raising awareness of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals at all levels of engagement. We have seen in action in New York and Washington, how the engagement at the national level with the villages, with the uh, different people in the, in, the, in, the, in the towns, in the cities. And, and what, why you put it as number one? Of, because the other ones are definitely not really simple topics because you put all of the other things, related to finance, related to implementation, or you put all of the lessons that we have listed so far. And of course, the coordination with your um, national plans and the vision 2025. Issues related to awareness, what you are doing differently, um, um, what extent you will be comfortable one day that whatever you are discussing in New York or in Washington or other places is being fully um, um, uh, um, uh, 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 endorsed and supported by the general public in, uh, in, in Jordan. Thank you, Doctor um, uh, it, it's, uh, it's truly a pleasure and an honor to be with you at the World Bank annual meeting and obviously with such a distinguished panel. Um, I want to emphasize, uh, obviously different countries have different perspectives, uh, but I want to mention a very critical point um, with all uh, humility. The 2030 agenda is a, is a comprehensive one, but it's very ambitious and complex. And, and I'll add to that even, it's not just the continuation of the thing, of, on the MDGs. I personally think, uh, you know, it has to involve a paradigm shift for developing countries in terms of how we develop. Uh, because it explains why, you know, the MDGs were not achieved. Um, uh, there's been great achievements, but there's been also a big part that was not achieved. Um, and the reason I mentioned that, because it is actually a paradigm shift in the model, the development model we're pursuing. We're trying actually to reconcile inclusive economic growth, social inclusion, and environmental sustainability in the 21st century. And that's, and that's, not, a very e that's not an easy task to do. That is a very difficult task to do. So for us at the national level, um, the first part was is we needed to not continue business as usual. This idea of thinking that the government can nationally plan something and take it over 15 years and achieve the results, um, it's not a top-down issue, it's both a top-down, bottom-up, and a full participatory approach that has to involve serious buy-in, buy -in. And a new point is very real. We decided very deliberately, um, and in view of what's happening in the Middle East and North Africa region, post the Arab Springs and everything happening, that the development model has to be changed. And it has to be part of the political reforms taking place and the way we're setting the development agenda at the national level. So we started nationally in 2016. We delayed doing our BNR to 2017 because we didn't want to go and present it unless we have seriously done uh, not symbolic uh, consultations, but real consultations. Um, and we established at the national level a high steering national committee that involved very strong participation by civil society, the business community, academia, and all the concerned government, parliament, media, and so on. So there is a national steering institutional setup that is taking place, and we've done a process of town hall meetings across the 12 different regions in Jordan, what we call the governorates, to start building the consensus and the awareness on the SDGs and where we're taking them. And we also um, uh, uh, started mainstreaming, um, obviously, the SDGs at the national level uh, to ensure success. We have about 18 national working teams uh, working on the 17 SDGs. Uh, with, a, with a steering committee that is integrating all the work. And in these um, uh, working groups, it's not just the government, the government, the private sector, civil society, represented and doing that work at the national level. 
And uh, we in Jordan don't have decentralization. We just started the process. And we started it this year with the elections um, uh, on top of the municipal elections that we've been doing since the 1920s, actually. We started for the first time for every region an elected council um, that is meant to start prioritizing the development of that uh, uh, governorate level um, uh, that will receive a, a, a budget, they'll choose the prioritization, they'll develop uh, the regional development plan. Um, the Ministry of Planning at the national level will be backstopping, we've established what is called uh, local development <coughs> technical units at the municipal levels across the 100 municipalities and at the 12 uh, regional elected councils, also a development uh, uh, unit that is helping the elected councils and the regional governments uh, put in place the regional development plans that have to feed into the national development plan, similar to what Indonesia uh, and my uh, uh, fellow esteemed minister has said. Uh, of course, Indonesia has a long history of doing the decentralization. We're just starting that process. Um, so how do we um, make sure that they both go along? I think that's going to be part of our uh, challenge. But we're going to have to continue that strong leadership at the national level um, uh, with a continued buy-in uh, and the mainstreaming we have done into the National Integrated Development Planning Framework, which is a three-year rolling plan that mainstreams the SDGs. And we have then governor development plans uh, that are at the local level being developed and their outputs get integrated into the national uh, development effort. Um, and, and we are taking care of making sure that this top-down uh, uh, and bottom-up uh, 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 interaction is taking place and is, is getting much uh, more developed as we um, help the elections of these regional councils uh, uh, just uh, basically a couple of months ago. Very good. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Minister. And I think you summarize it nicely again when you mentioned both the bottom up and the top down, because we see matters are very much going into different directions, not like um, what it used um, uh, to be. So there are many areas that you can see the comparative advantage in the center, and in many areas you can really see the comparative advantage at the grassroots. And the, the whole thing is basically how to get this machine working nicely together is a coordination uh, challenge and an information um, sharing challenge as well. Um, now, the, um, I, I would just notify that we have uh, lots of people as well following us uh, online, um, so we thank them as well. Um, so they are watching us uh, uh, by the uh, web streaming service. Um, so that we'll, we'll wrap up in like. Um, 10 minutes from now, yes. So now we have the private sector again represented by a leading um, company um, and the corporation that's field, uh, Swissly. Life insurance fund, life insurance asset management, this is what we know as layman about um, the insurance service, but there are more um, um, uh, of functions and services and contribution that the insurance industry can do, especially when really to risk, to risk mitigation. So um, um, we have with us here uh, uh, Mr. Martin Parker, um, um, who is uh, who's going to be sharing his views uh, and ideas, either from his industry or from the private sector. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. And, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's very pleasure to be with you. And I'm very happy to hear the structured approach that's been taken. But there is something that threatens the achievement the SDGs, which is beyond the control of anybody in this room. And that is Mother Nature. And what we've seen in recent weeks and months has been some terrible natural disasters. And we know that natural disasters set back economic progress. And they've been set by the World Bank Report for 2016, set back 26 million people a year into poverty. So for the first time, there's something being set back. So 2017 will be remembered as a high natural catastrophe year. And it's on our way to the SDGs of 2030. We have to start thinking about how we can be resilient in our progress against those interruptions. 
So insurance can play a key role. And in fact, more and more government, governments are buying insurance for themselves, but with the protection of the poor community in mind. And I think that's a very important trend. You might ask why it makes sense for governments. And there are really two reasons that I would highlight. The first reason is if you swap the volatile risk off your balance sheet into the balance sheet of the insurance industry for a fixed price, which is no less. The second reason is insurance works. If you take the Irma and Maria hurricanes that went through the Caribbean, the Caribbean catastrophe risk insurance facilities finished paying its claims. It spent 50 millions in settlement US dollars within 14 days of the events and proves that the insurance can get the money there quickly when it needs to be there and can be applied by the governments at their most important priorities. Three very quick examples in the interest of time. In China, the State Council is encouraging provincial level, so localizing the implementation of SDGs, to buy insurance for poverty alleviation. And the big programs are looking at weather risks, and one program in particular has included flood and drought. It's included extreme variances in temperature, which interrupts the crop production, and excess rainfall. I haven't mentioned the drought and the flood, but with particular excess rainfall, you may wonder why those two things are different, but of course, excess rainfall can lead to landslides and all sorts of other catastrophes, which is not necessarily the same as flood. In Mexico, the federal government is encouraging state and incentivizing state purchase of insurance, again, for helping the people who are most vulnerable. And whilst it's not a climate risk, I suppose about earthquakes recently, and in the state of Oaxaca, uh, they are paying through their insurance for the rebuilding of the homes for the vulnerable. And a final example is the Philippines, where they average 20 typhoons, or the Sorokins, making landfall every year. And they've now bought some insurance for the first time with World Bank support. I think mean, that's an important point to note, uh, which protects 25 of the most vulnerable provinces. And just in two Give you the figure there, 2009, two typhoons that made landfall in the Philippines caused $4.4 billion of damage, economic damage. So to achieve the SDGs, I think to finalize, I would say we need to increase the resilience, so we will make progress, but Mother Nature can interrupt that. So we need to improve that resilience and find ways of getting cash on site quickly to overcome those setbacks. Put insurance in your toolbox start thinking about it today, because it could wipe out the progress. Uh, I think for the World Bank, you've done some fantastic work for the World Bank Treasury of bringing insurance vehicles uh, to the fore, so there's more to do in this area, so we can wake up demand uh, together. Thank you. Very good. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, now, uh, before I give the uh, concluding remarks to uh, Mr. Steiner to uh, conclude the wrap up and thank everybody on behalf, not just of the bank, of the multilateral system. Um, I'd like to ask Ms. Hoven, um, who's here, just for one minute, I know that you didn't expect that. Uh, she was here as uh, executive director responsible for uh, the coordination uh, as the chair of the ED, uh, of the chair of the German um, um, uh, uh, office here and the ED for Germany. And Germany made a fantastic uh, contribution um, uh, last year uh, through the High Level Director Forum. And one of the main things we managed to do with this issue of the coordination between the center and the different uh, member uh, uh, states. So, if, you, if you'd like to share something of your experience in one minute, while Mr. Steiner is, uh, as always, prepared, well, um, did you like to take the podium, uh, Mr. Steiner? Or will you speak from your what? Speak from you. That's not right. Okay. Thanks, Robert. Thank you um, so much, Mark. Um, let me first thank um, the speakers and the ministers. I think one should uh, have more of those stories really uh, spread out to the world because you actually have demonstrated that since 2015 we have made a lot of progress and so much things are ongoing in countries at the local level. 
And this should encourage us even as a donor, as an institution, um, to, to do more in this respect. In Germany, what was key for our national um, sustainability strategy is actually to bring the different stakeholders on board. And that's how that means, especially if we want to embark um, on the longer term on ambition and climate protection um, schemes. And we did this in, in round tables, we brought in the private sector, we brought in the federal and states, uh, local communities, um, which are pretty well organized. And we try to make sure that the national strategy is being shared and being owned by all of those, those sectors. This has been an effort for months, as has been also um, taking place in, in Jordan and, and in Indonesia. So the big thing out of elaborating the strategy was actually how can we institutionalize a system that remains so that it's not simply a one-shot um, engagement process. In our civil society actually made it clear that we should institutionalize a platform um, which could meet every year, that we could monitor whether we do progress, whether we are still on the right track, or whether we are actually deviating into something that is not sustainable. And this has been agreed upon. And we are trying to build up a system that makes actually the SDG stronger in its implementation because it remains in the society. Thank you so much. Start. Thank you, Mahmoud. I think we have heard a fascinating set of things this afternoon, and, and I think all of them speak to perhaps two or three phenomena that we are we're observing. One is the SDGs, which some people associate with something that was decided in the General Assembly of War in 2015, actually was born out of the reality that we see on this top of here. The, the SDGs are unusual in the way that they were they were crafted and born. And, and indeed, Colombia played a very significant role in this in the lead up to the, to the Rio uh, summit in 20, 2012. What has now happened is that, in some respects, having been endorsed, adopted by the world leaders and, and, and nations, they are beginning to go viral. What a strange thing to happen. Sustainable development goals, targets and indicators. I was yesterday in San Francisco at a conference with 3,000 impact investors. And they invited me to come and speak to them about how they are working with the SDGs. And it wasn't that I had to do the basic homework on what are the SDGs, why should you? They were saying, this is the kind of thing we are trying to do. This is where we need help. This is how we see the intergovernmental or the national governmental systems being critical to enabling us to work on, on the SDGs. What we have looked at this afternoon is also this notion of localizing. I think, Minister, you, you said that awareness is critically important. I think awareness not so much in making people learn off by heart the seven sustainable development goals, but understanding how we can empower one another. How can, how can national governments empower the kind of innovation, incubation, and experimentation at local level where actually the frontier of development happens every day? And we have seen examples and, and you know, the experience across our organization, the World Bank Group, the United Nations family, is watching countries at the moment. We've seen some of the examples here already um, of how decisions at the center about empowering the cascade down to subnational units, to municipalities and districts, can very rapidly translate into an acceleration curve. Secondly, what is also interesting to observe is participation increases exponentially the closer you get to the local governance level, because it is there where people can really engage on making decisions. Much more difficult when you have to go to the capital and to the parliaments and so on. So there's an enormous multiplier effect just in terms of the number of people engaged. Thirdly, financing. It is much easier to finance the kind of frontline of development and innovation that the SDGs are calling for at the local level because the scale is different. It also allows more players to come into their resources, including the private sector and those who have funds and want to do something for a community. So again, financing becomes a more manageable issue because you localize it generally 2030. And localizing does not mean a one-way journey. I think that's the other lesson we're learning, how we begin to change national policy as a result of the SDGs. A final remark, if you allow me. At local government, we sometimes see the greatest confidence of dealing with complexity. 
The man of Medellin knows exactly what each of the 17 goals means to different constituencies in his community. And he has to manage them almost on a daily basis as a system approach to development. So let me end by saying, sometimes I worry about the temptation that we now treat the goals as if they are sort of pick the three that you really think are important to you. That, I think, is legitimate. Because a land or a country will not worry about the ocean's goal as the first instance. But let us always remember the logic of the SDGs is also about, yes, prioritize certain things you want to do, but don't forget the other ones, because sooner or later you will pay a very heavy price for it. And I think at the local level, that is even more evident more quickly than in the abstract national data and metrics of, of development that measures inequality and GDP coefficients or returns on investment. So it's a reality check about it. Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank you all for being here and thank all of those who participated um, uh, through online and of course for our uh, distinguished panels and the earlier uh, uh, panel as well. Thank you so much and uh, very productive uh, annual meeting still. Thank you.